Have you ever met one of those people who just can't be stopped? It's like they're unstoppable. Yeah, I have. Me too. What's their mystique? Nothing stops these people. Don't stop. Welcome to Mission Unstoppable with Coach Frankie Picasso. You're about to meet some of the most amazing people. They've accomplished their goals despite insurmountable odds. They beat adversity, physical hardship, and traumatic events, and emerge triumphantly. They're people just like you and me, and they're winners. Are you unstoppable? Here's Frankie to show you how. Hello, I am your host, Frankie Picasso, and I know that you're unstoppable. Today, I am so excited to take you on another mission, Unstoppable, and our guide today is a gentleman who has been an actionary to make our world a better place for a long time. What's an actionary, you ask? It's a visionary who takes action. For over a decade, Shell Horowitz, a.k.a. the Transformpreneur, has shown businesses how to go green affordably and effectively and how to market that green commitment to win new customers, turn those customers into fans, and turn those fans into ambassadors. He also shows consumers how to green their own lives while actually improving quality of life. Now, he's an international speaker, a TEDx talker, whose popular talks include Impossible is Not a Fact, It's a Dare, and Making Green Sexy. He's the author of 10 books, including the long-running category bestseller, Guerrilla Marketing Goes Green, and the just-published Guerrilla Marketing to Heal the World. And that's the book we're going to talk about today. After saving a mountain that was once thought an impossible task, Shell was inspired to focus on other impossible tasks too, like showing you how business can make an impact solving problems like hunger, poverty, war, violence, and catastrophic climate change, all while making a healthy profit. Impossible, you say? Not even. Today, Shell and I will speak about these businesses who are doing just that and more. We're going to speak about how you too can rebrand, refocus, and revitalize and renew your business to become socially conscious and go from thinking sustainable to thinking about regeneration, restoration, and thriving. Welcome, Shell. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Frankie. A pleasure to be with you. I think we are kindred spirits. (laughs) I think so. I think so. I read that uh, you were three years old the first time you took conscious action to improve the world. That's pretty phenomenal. Can you tell us what you did? Sure. My parents were having a party, and all their friends were sitting around the living room smoking cigarettes, and I knew even at three years old that being around cigarette smoke was not good for me, so I quietly crawled around uh, under the coffee table breaking people's cigarettes in half (laughs) and and making my environment cleaner. That's so funny. And what was the response when people went to reach for them? You know, nobody caught me at it, so there was no response. Oh, wow. That's pretty funny. But it set me on a life of of social change. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) That's one way to do it. I have to say, Guerrilla Marketing to Heal the World is a fabulous book. I loved reading this book, and I just, you know, I have to show it to everybody. I'm going to send you a picture of me holding it. The... I have this conversation all the time in my home about, you know, I'm the positive. I believe in, you know, business can make a profit and do good things in the world. And my husband's like, no, the only way to make a profit is greedy, you know, those greedy corporations. And so it's so great to see these shining examples of what I knew to be true. You were really speaking my language and it felt really good to know that there are lots of advocates out there who feel the same way that we do. So anybody uh, who's a naysayer, this book is for you because social enterprise is the most fabulous, fabulous thing going. I think You offer a lot of really great ideas in the book too. And some that people might think of as counterintuitive, like promoting your competitor or God mm-hmm. forbid, setting the business. <laughs> Interestingly enough, Frankie, a lot of the most successful companies in the world have figured out that partnering with their competitors is a, a good thing. Now, you're up in Canada, so this may be different for you, but those of your listeners in the United States, have you ever thought how is it that the United States Postal Service, which, you know, we all grew up laughing at how they were always sure. losing mail and such, how are they able to guarantee next day delivery of express mail? And the answer is they hire FedEx to move that express mail from airport to airport. Okay, there you go. Yeah. I mean, so the smart first, partnering. Uh, the first car I ever bought new was essentially a Toyota Corolla, but it said Chevrolet on the front. It was a partnership between General Motors and Toyota. 
And over and over again, big companies have figured out that in, in the one and only time you'll ever hear me quote George W. Bush, that we all benefit when you make the pie higher. Mm-hmm. And um, it's really true that when you cooperate, amazing things happen. I, I, just as a, a much more locally focused and small business example, I happen to live next to a town that's really known very widely for its restaurants. Oh, okay. And with 30,000 people, they've got like over 100 restaurants. Wow. Now, yeah. how did they get to be such a restaurant center? Well, for about 12 or 15 years, every year they took over one of the big city parking lots and had a restaurant festival where 40 or 50 of the restaurants would serve small portions of their specialties for a couple of bucks. And people would come from 50 or 100 miles to try these foods. And then they'd come back later in the year and sit down to dinner at the restaurants they like and uh, take in a show, maybe, and it became a real kind of part of its destinationness, if you will. Right, uh, and yeah. that was a way of banding together and, and making everything bigger for everybody. I love that. I mean, it's just like, like you know, even in communities, neighborhoods have garage sales together. Everybody mm-hmm. bands together and brings all their stuff. And so, you know, more is better. More is better. But what's even better than more is helping others. <laughs> With it. So, you know, you, you talk in the book, you say enlightened self-interest can get it done while guilt and shame fail. So you speak a lot about abundance in the book. So coming from that perspective of abundance rather than lack, is that what you mean by that? Enlightened self-interest? That's part of it. Yeah. Uh, and abundance is different from prosperity. Prosperity is really about the money in your wallet. And abundance is about the goals you want to achieve that the money in your wallet can help you get, which mm-hmm. may be through money or it may be through other means. So, you know, certainly... You know, abundance is something that I feel very much has been a factor in my life. I I feel like my life is just absolutely jammed with blessings. It's a wonderful thing. I'm looking out here at this beautiful scenery. I grew up in New York City. I lived for a while on the 20th floor of a 26-story building in a, um, how many were there, 35 high-rise complex that was not important enough to even get a subway station. (laughs) And, uh, And now I live on a beautiful dairy farm in Massachusetts oh, with really? a mountain nice. behind my house and the Connecticut River in front of my house. And uh, just, you know, abundance touches every part of my life, and I'm very grateful for it. Well, you've been, you've been you know, a greenpreneur for a long time. And can you tell us where that came from to begin with? Well, I was kind of a captive of the first Earth Day <laughs> back in 1970, <laughs> and I thought I was... 13, and I thought, well, that makes sense. We should be talking about our planet as, as an important player here. Right. And that was the beginning of a long and complicated journey. But really, very early on, even as far back as 1971, again, I grew up in New York City, and our local utility decided that two miles north of New York City was a good place to put a nuclear power plant. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, a few of us got together and started looking into this, and we hadn't looked very far before they decided that maybe that wasn't such a good idea, and they withdrew the proposal. So I was, how old was I in 1971? I was 14. Right. And uh, we had a victory there. And, <laughs> and then later, actually, when I was in college a couple of years later, I, I did a project on nuclear power, and I discovered just how bad it really was and how little we had known when we beat that nuke next to New York. And so my first book came out in 1980, uh, shortly after Three Mile Island, and it was about why nuclear power makes no sense at all. And then I kind of took a a long detour into small business and marketing and uh, the the things that I was mostly known for in the 90s and early 2000s. But always in the back of my mind was, how can we be using this for good? And Mm -hmm. um, I started moving my own marketing, consulting, and copywriting portfolio more in the direction of companies that were doing something to make the world better, green companies. And I started also reading a lot about how green technologies could really be harnessed effectively, because uh, uh, there's this myth out there that green has to be complicated, green has to be expensive. Mm -hmm. And the reality is it doesn't. Often it's simpler, cheaper, more profitable, easier, because you think systemically. You're not looking at one small piece. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, it's interesting that, you know, we, well, we're talking about being green, but there, there's somebody um, that, that you talk a lot about in your book, um, uh, Avery Lovins and his. Avery Lovins, yeah. 
in his home in Colorado. Tell folks about that home. What's okay, so special well, about it? this is built in a suburb of Aspen, Colorado. Aspen, of course, is known for skiing. For skiing, you need snow, and for snow, you need cold weather. Well, this house, which was built, by the way, back in 1983, this okay. house doesn't have a furnace, okay? It's, it's in the snow belt in Aspen, and it doesn't have a furnace. It doesn't have a furnace, and it grows bananas. <laughs> <laughs> because it is so warm inside that a furnace would be completely superfluous. Isn't so Lovins' cool? idea is if you build well enough, if you design well enough that you don't need things like a furnace or an air conditioner, then the money you save can pay for the improvements. And uh, he was involved with a very, very interesting project to greenify the Empire State Building, of all things. That's phenomenal. And, well, yeah. So that, that building was costing a fortune. Yeah. It was built in 1931 when gas and oil were fairly close to free. Right. Um, it really, it was pennies for a, for a barrel of, of oil back then. And so, needless to say, energy efficiency was not high on their agenda when they designed this building. So Lovins and Johnson Controls and a consortium of a few other companies got together. It was not a cheap project. It was $13 million. Wow. But the payback was $4.4 million every year. That's wow. a 33% ROI. Um, to get a 33% ROI in today's economy is pretty darn good. Yeah, pretty phenomenal. Oh, my goodness. So in three years, Amazing. they paid for that whole $13 million and then they have m money to play with that they didn't have before. And, okay, let's say after a few years, they'll, they'll put a third of it aside for maintenance. That's still going to give you, you know, over, over $2 million a year to, to play with that you didn't have before. That's a whole whack of money. That's a whole whack yeah. of money. So we're going to go to a commercial break in just a few minutes or a few seconds, actually. But was Lovins an architect? Is that his background? He's a physicist, I think. Okay. But he's okay. very cross-disciplinary. Right. Yeah, it sounds like it. I want to talk a little bit more about how, how all of this came into play, too, because it's very exciting to me. I love this. You know, I, I did a road trip recently through the U.S., and, and you just see wind, wind farms, wind farms everywhere. And I don't know how effective wind farms are, but you probably do. So we'll talk about solar energy and wind energy and, and all of that great stuff when we come back from our break. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. We're coming back. We're speaking to Shell Horowitz, author of Guerrilla Marketing to Heal the World and Green Expert. So you're going to want to come back. Don't go anywhere. Don't stop. That's right. Don't stop listening. Mission Unstoppable with Coach Frankie Picasso will continue right after these messages. Don't stop. It's marching frequently drive on a street named Cemetery Hill, which makes me wonder who got to name these streets anyway. Whoever named Psychopath Road in Michigan, for example, must have been off his cursive. I mean, who would ever want that for a mailing address? In Alabama, there is a This Ain't It Road. I guess this is where a lot of lost drivers end up. Personally, I would like to live on Slim Bottoms Road in Mount Vernon, New York, even though some might say that would constitute a bit of a teradiddle. That's a little white lie. So what do you call the business of naming things? Onomastics. Finally, there's Little Schmuck Road in Indiana and Cannibal Road in California. I'm sure that keeps people from trespassing. It's marching day. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Words. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert, Annette Hammond. There are a multitude of positive and wonderful things about winter. But when the weather and temperatures become colder, it's easy for weariness to set in. Many people become tired and have low energy when it's overcast and or cold. According to a University of Georgia study, you can increase your energy level by 20% by doing a low-intensity workout like walking. These researchers believe that such light workouts stimulate your body and mind and decrease fatigue by 65%. Exercise gets the blood flowing throughout your body, sending positive signals to your brain. If a low-intensity exercise like this can make such a difference in your energy, think about how you will feel after an intense workout like running or circuit training. Increasing your energy and boosting your mood are simple byproducts of exercise, and there is so much more. For the Fitness Minute, I'm Annette Hammond.
And we're back and we were talking about energy and different kinds of energy. And I mentioned about the wind farms or the, the uh, yeah, the wind farms that I had seen as we traveled through the U.S. And Shell, you know a thing or two about them anyway. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, I'm more of a supporter of small-scale decentralized wind and solar than of big solar or wind farms. Okay. Uh, I, I think one of the things that I was not aware of until I started looking into this is how much energy is lost transmitting power across great distances. So if you make it oh, where you okay. need it, that's better. Uh, right. And also there are new technologies around wind, particularly what's called vertical access, which is, uh, sorry, vertical axis. If you think about a broomstick pointing up and rotors around the broomstick, kind of like uh, an oil drum cut into the shape of a daisy, right. it can catch wind in a lot of ways a lot more efficiently than those big giant turbines and without the issues of bird kill and whatnot. But still, I'd rather see big wind farms than nuclear or coal or natural gas. Uh, so it's a step in the right direction. Right. And actually, I, thank you for bringing up the bird thing, because that was one thing that I had thought about when, um, you know, we talk about saving energy and turning lights off in, in, you know, the buildings at night when people aren't working and and that kind of stuff. So what do we have for the birds? Because I know that, that we often downtown, when I worked downtown Toronto, um, we would leave lights on so the birds wouldn't run into the building. Yeah, and I don't really know what you do about that. <laughs> there probably okay. needs to be some some illumination there, but it could be LED lights, which are very cheap to run and use very, very little energy. You know, we were talking about Amory Lovins before, and one of his right. concepts that I just love is the idea of negawatts and negabarrels, which are the energy you save by not using it in the first place. Oh, okay. That's yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> so that's actually a big untapped resource. We could easily uh, cut our energy use by half because that would bring us to what the U.K. and Germany and Denmark are already doing. And we could probably cut it by half again. So we could be using one quarter of the energy that we're using now. And then, of course, the idea of using fossil fuels becomes much less attractive because it's clear that we have enough from solar, wind, geothermal, magnetic, and all the other cool technologies out there. Right. That we don't need to do the polluting, non-renewable, carbon footprinty ones that we've been relying on so long. <laughs> you know, and we're jumping around a little bit, and I, and I, and I want to take us back to the beginning because one thing that really struck me in the book was the idea of corporate greed, and it was corporate greed in 2008 <laughs> that you know uh, took so many people down, down you know, uh, with them, and the idea that you can really make a healthy profit better than a healthy profit and help the environment and help the world one example was the delight company Let, let's talk about that the, this yeah D-Light. this is one of my favorite examples because it hits on several different issues at once delight is one of a number of companies that have gone into the business of solar powered led lanterns and you say so what's the big deal solar powered led lanterns so what mm-hmm. well here's the so what They are going into places throughout Asia and Africa where the dominant lighting has been kerosene. Now, let me tell you a little bit about kerosene. Kerosene is nasty stuff. First of all, a lot of people die or are seriously injured in kerosene fires, so there's a huge safety risk. Mm -hmm. The fumes are toxic, so there's a health problem. Uh, The light quality is crap, (laughs) frankly, so you're not getting much benefit from this lamp. It's slightly better than sitting around in the dark, but not really all that good. So they come in, and they do it with a model that, okay, let's say the family's been paying $2 a month for kerosene. So they put those $2 a month toward the purchase of this LED solar lantern, then they never need to buy kerosene again, and if they've only got twenty, thirty dollars worth a month of income to get two dollars extra in disposable income after ten months. That's a huge, huge change. Mm-hmm. Then on top of that, they've eliminated entirely the fire. They've eliminated entirely the toxic fumes. So they're living longer and healthier lives. And then the quality of light is good enough that maybe after a day working in the field, then maybe they can do some little cottage industry and their kids can sit around and study longer and get better grades in school and eventually better jobs. So what you've created with this $20 lamp is a ladder out of poverty. Right. And a ladder out of poverty that's greener and safer and healthier. 
I mean, wow. <laughs> wow is, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really phenomenal, really phenomenal. And the idea that is, you know, that you're really thinking about other people, about people, you know, um, affordability and, um, you know, so the finance, the environment, the social metrics, what you call the triple bottom line, you know, corporate social responsibility. The, the You know, this goes way beyond just, you know, our little world. It's the whole world and thinking, you know, mm-hmm. holistically about everything and everybody and how it affects all of us. You know, yeah. I'm so... And, you know, Frank, sorry. one of the interesting things is when you do think holistically about all of this, you realize that a lot of the biggest problems, hunger, poverty, even war, um, they often come down to resource issues. Who has what resources? Who doesn't have what resources? What are the, the, the positives and negatives of that? And how is it playing out? And what sorts of industries are built around those resources? And when you start looking at that, a lot of the stuff, all of a sudden, kind of the fog lifts and you can see your way clear. And you can see that these problems are actually solvable and that we know how to do a lot of this. Not only do we know how to do it, you know, simpler sometimes is just better. <laughs> you know, I, I had somebody on the show a while ago who who went to hospitals in third worlds and, and looked at you know how they sanitized and they didn't sanitize anything and she goes how can we make this affordable how can we help people sanitize how can they go to surgery with clean instruments and they came up with the idea of the old fashioned pressure cooker but a pressure cooker that they could put on on a wood fire mm-hmm. you know not because you can't plug it in there's no electricity sometimes right. so we really have to think about every aspect of what we're doing, you know, to help yeah. people. And it can be so simple. I mean, I, I know a guy who 30 years ago bought himself a solar shower, and what it was was a black rubber bag that he stuck out in the yard to heat water, and then in the evening he'd bring it in and take his hot shower. You know, that's a technology that's accessible to most of the world. I know that you talked about in the book, uh, and because and you're concerned about waste and about brushing your teeth, you said, you know, you don't have to let the water run full force while you brush your teeth. You turn it on, you turn it off. Big deal, right? The, it is a big it, deal. It's yeah, no, I mean, it is a big deal. Year. It's not a big deal to turn it off. It's not a big deal to turn it off and turn it back on. And I had met a couple, I was on a cruise, and I met a couple that, that said, you know, they were very concerned about this wastewater in the shower. And so they, they capture, you know, the gray water, and they mm-hmm. use it to water their plants and do whatever with it. Um, and then they clean it and they put it back in the shower again somehow. And, you know, it's very innovative thinking for, uh, you know, a two-person home. Yeah. Something we yeah. all and think about this, doing. This uh, brings up actually one of the gifts that I would like to give your listeners. And it's an ebook called Painless Green, and it's got 111 different ideas, most of which cost little or nothing for saving energy and water. It talks about how to brush your teeth or wash a dish with almost no water. Uh, and this is something that those of us, you're kind of in the same bioregion as I am, that uh, mm-hmm. eastern U.S., southern Canada piece, uh, we here are just, we absolutely squander water. Yeah, And we're going to be sorry, if not now, then 50 or 100 years from now. We're going to be very, very sorry about that. But we can change that. So yeah, I, I was watching a documentary called Blue Gold. You know, water mm-hmm. is, is, the new, is the next gold. And yeah, people are and lying up and trying so to own it. so much of it and, and squandered so much of it that we really need to start being careful. We saw what happened with, like, five years of drought in California that just ended with flooding over the winter. Yeah. Um, so painlessgreenbook.com. Awesome. Slash Earth people. Day, mm-hmm. one word, Earth Day, and then the, you'll need the code Earth Day, and that will get you that nine ninety five ebook for free. Oh wow, that's so generous of you. Thank you so much, and folks are really going to appreciate this book. I know they are. That's wonderful. Thank you. We there. Um, <laughs> I want to. How, how much time do we have, Karina? Because I want to go into another segment here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you have a section in the book called Mother Nature chief engineer. And I loved reading about this. This was so exciting to me because if, if we just, you know, was that the biomimicry, you know, with yeah. Ben, yeah. yes. when you, if we watch nature and how nature just knows how to do everything, it knows how yeah. to do it all. And all we have to do is just mimic it. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Yeah, but it. we think we're smarter. We have never invented a solar collector as powerful as, as the photosynthesis that we take for granted with every. Yeah. Human. We have never invented a bridge building technique or material as powerful as any spider has. This is true. And they do this with no heat, with no outside force energy other than the sun, 
with um, no chemical additives. They just do it out of water and bug guts. You know, they make yeah. they make cable that's strong enough that if you blow it up proportionally to our size, you could actually catch a moving jet with a spider web. Wow! It is that strong. Can we can we create that? Oh, there are people working on it, but wow. you know we're not even at the Model T stage with this yet. We're at the yeah. very, very earliest stages of after ten thousand years of of recorded human history. <laughs> we're finally looking at okay, well, how is the natural world able to do all these things that we work so hard at? Let's be lazy and look at what they're doing, and then be not so lazy and figure out reverse engineer it, which is a lot of work, right? <laughs> but also very exciting. So where where if people were interested in doing something like this, and I know well, I've got somebody coming on in, in a couple of weeks um, from oh geez, a little African country, but they're taking the the, the waste of uh, some insect that they have there and turning it into a crop um, fertilizer, and and it's just absolutely amazing what they're doing and how they're doing it, and you know the, these guys. Who knows what they know, and I don't know if that bug is anywhere else. But you know, this is this is using what they see and and turning it into a, a method of survival, a sustainability mm-hmm. for themselves. So yeah, it's what, important what... to recognize that nature does not have waste. Uh-huh. When nature has a byproduct, it becomes an input for something else. They eat it. The most <laughs> obvious cycle there is that we breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide, Mm -hmm. where plants breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen. That is, by nature standards, an unusually small loop. It's just two steps. But a lot of times you'll, you'll have processes that are six or seven levels deep. Mm-hmm. going around in a circle. So, and, and people are starting to imitate this. Uh, in the book, I talk about John Todd's work with the Intervale. I want to talk about that. Brewery, and the brewery uh, creates spent grain waste, and that spent grain becomes a perfect place to grow mushrooms. And the mushroom waste is fed to a tilapia crop, so there's fish involved. And, again, several cycles going back and forth. And this same man, John Todd. Wait, has don't talk. Developed... Don't talk about it yet, because we're going to go to a commercial break in just a minute. Okay. So I, I want to talk about that because it's super important and super impressive. I just think it's absolutely phenomenal. And and let's think about some other examples where you have the loop and you know where we don't waste. It's it's absolutely phenomenal. Stick around. You don't want to go anywhere. Shell Horowitz is my guest. You're listening to Mission Unstoppable Radio. I'm your host, Frankie Picasso. Don't stop. That's right. Don't stop listening. Mission Unstoppable with Coach Frankie Picasso will continue right after these messages. Stop. LinkedIn. It's a great tool and a great way to do business in today's social media driven world. And Carol McManus is the LinkedIn Lady with the LinkedIn Lady Show. Tuesday and Wednesday afternoons at 4 p.m. Eastern on AllBusinessRadioNetwork.com. The LinkedIn Lady Show is designed to inform, inspire, and educate businesses. Every social media site has a specific demographic, personality, and purpose. And the LinkedIn Lady will interview a variety of guests, such as business owners who can showcase their business and talk about how they use social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google+, Pinterest, and of course, LinkedIn. For more on Carol and the show, check out her website, LinkedInLady.com. As trends change and new applications become available, the LinkedIn Lady Show will bring that information to you in an easy-to-use, fun, and engaging way. Every Tuesday and Wednesday afternoons at 4 p.m. Eastern, it's the LinkedIn Lady Show with Carol McManus on AllBusinessRadioNetwork.com. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert, Annette Hammond. Golf is a good way to supplement your fitness program, but watch out for golf injuries. The most common occur in the low back, elbows, shoulders, hands, and wrists, and are defined as either cumulative from overuse or acute traumatic injuries. The impact and stress of the repetitive motion of the swing is sometimes hard on the muscles and joints. The Mayo Clinic says it's important to consider ways to reduce your risk of golf injuries. They recommend that you warm up first. Be sure to start slowly, work up to your desired level of play, strengthen your muscles to protect your joints, and reduce your risk of injury and build up your endurance. Focus on flexibility and keep your muscles pliable, strong, and flexible. For the Fitness Minute, I'm Annette Hammond. If you're a fan of Fitness Minute, like us on Facebook.
And we're back with Shel Horowitz, my guest, author of Guerrilla Marketing to Heal the World. We're talking about nature and how nature uh, is a chief engineer, and she's just absolutely phenomenal. So we were talking um, about John Todd, and let's let's talk about what he did that is so amazing and phenomenal, because, folks, this is, like, incredible. Yeah, so first... For the first thing that we talked about before the break was this project in Vermont that he did where several different industries worked together to create, to take the waste of the previous step and, and use it as an input, use it as a food, essentially, mm-hmm. um, and, and to create that circular economy. But then he took this concept much farther and developed these things called restorers, where literally hundreds or even thousands of different organisms are combined together in very specific ways to specifically clean particular pollutants in particular places. So uh, the, the, you can have, I think there was one thing he did with 28,000 different plants to restore the water quality to what it was before humans mucked it up. So sometimes... Yeah, this, this, this place was toxic, they, absolutely toxic, right? Yeah. And, he, and, and he came up with this idea and these plants that brought it, actually brought it back to clean drinking water from toxic... It's and we incredible. can do this all over the place. So you, you were talking about gray water recycling before. There's yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody I mentioned in the book uh, who's figured out a way to reuse the heat from showers and to only heat the water, uh, heat a lot less water for taking showers uh, and, and basically keeping that heat recycled. Oh, that's cool. And it's just phenomenal. You know, there are, I've also I've put a lot of resources together up on transformpreneur.com, which mm-hmm. is the word transform and then P-R-E-N-E-U-R, like the second half of entrepreneur. And um, there's, among other things, there's an assessment that people can take on how, t- how socially transformative and how green their business is right now. And obviously, uh, I'm available to help interpret that and to help people think about how with my particular strengths and my particular company history and profile, what can I be doing? What kinds of products and services can I be creating and marketing that really make a difference on hunger or poverty or war or climate change or better yet, all of the above as like the delight people? I, I want to talk about some of the, the the companies that people will know and maybe they don't know, but one of my very favorite ones was Greystone Bakery. Because mm-hmm. Greystone Bakery, um, they they say we don't hire people to bake brownies. We bake brownies to hire, to people. hire people. I love I that. I love Both that. Them. I love that. Yeah. And, and, and they've you know, been very successful. They are the brownie baker for Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Uh-huh. And their model of hiring is you put your name on a list, and when your name comes up, you get offered a job. It doesn't matter if you're an ex-addict, an ex-offender. Uh, an ex-mental patient, it, it, it's, if you are willing to work, they will train you. And so this has become a way for really marginal people in a very depressed economic area uh, to create a viable job history, to move out of poverty, and to, to become a player in the workforce. And, and they, they consciously will, just put I mean, their bakery in They will let you know a... if you're not working out, but they will give anybody a chance, and they will give some pretty – uh, ex- extensive training to make sure that it's going to work. Uh, that's phenomenal. I mean, that is such a, an amazing attitude to have. And they put and they put it in a, in a depressed area, you know, for that reason. So they're not even in a you know, they're helping the neighborhood. They're helping the neighborhood, yeah. like the pizza guy in Jersey who helped the neighborhood. Right? People come in and they they put IOUs up so that homeless people or whoever didn't have money that day could go in and get a slice of pizza to eat. Mm-hmm. I love you know people like that. They're awesome. But let's go to the bigger companies. Now, one thing that, you know, I understood why they said it, but it kind of bothered me. Um, I think it was with Ford Motor Company that, that they were um, they were supporting cancer. And somebody had said, no, you shouldn't be supporting cancer. You should be supporting, you know, the, the gas and oil industry if you're going to, you know, help. Okay, it's one thing to help, and, and it's a good thing. I understand why they would say that. But at the same time, you know, if you're going to help, you're helping. Maybe yeah, they were this. criticized for uh, yeah. making Susan G. Komen Foundation one of their main charities. Personally, I think you know any charity work is good, but mm-hmm. then it does make sense to look for where you can be aligned with your core mission. 
Exactly. So if the board's yeah. mission is transportation, where can they make a difference in transportation? And maybe it's in creating rideshare services in places where people have a hard time getting to work. Uh, or maybe it's in recreating the public transit that General Motors in particular was involved in sabotaging in the 1930s. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's uh, so I, I look for that congruence. I think it's stronger when you have it. Yeah. But if, you, if you're doing charity work that's not related to your core mission, it's still probably better than not doing that work. I think, you know, I, I've known a lot of organizations that, that chose charities based on things that happened with their CEO. Like there was an Amber, you know, one had an Amber Alert, so they give it to the Amber Alert because their granddaughter had, you know, had been abducted, things like that. So they're not, they're not always in alignment, but they're in alignment with, with their their um, character, let's say, or, or their um, their value system, mm -hmm. you know? So, mm -hmm. but let's talk about you know, these companies, we're, we're telling them, hey, you can make a lot of money and help people. So let's talk about who's making a lot of money and helping people. Patagonia comes to mind, uh, the outdoor um, equipment manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Very, very socially conscious company. They actually ran an ad at one point saying, don't buy this jacket. <laughs> and uh, it really was an anti-materialism ad. So that was a, a wonderful thing that they did. And they've been a, a, a huge player in making that whole industry very much more environmentally friendly. And this is, right. uh, they got their start making pitons, and uh, Yvonne Chouinard, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, the founder, really looked at, well, gee, does it make any sense to be knocking holes in all of these mountains? Is there a better way to do it? And that was the start of Patagonia, and this is now decades old. Ben and Jerry's, we mentioned them before, they have always been a leader in, hiring people from disadvantaged communities in promoting solar and alternative energy. And I think the reason why they have 40% or more of the super premium ice cream market in the United States is precisely that. Because if you are in a grocery store and you're faced with Ben and Jerry's that you know where some portion of your $4 a pint is going into really good work mm -hmm. or the Exxon of ice cream, Hagen yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cold corporate um, company that makes a very good product, but the social consciousness, environmental consciousness is not something people associate with them. Where are you going to spend your four bucks? You know what's interesting? I, I a long time ago I, I interviewed this woman a few times. She she was the she's a Gestalt graphologist, and Ben and Jerry's had her um, look at, at at employees' handwritings before they hired them executives hmm. to see who they were. Oh, She's well. phenomenally accurate. She's absolutely amazing. Ben and Jerry's but... was also one of the first companies to pioneer the idea that CEOs should only get a multiple of what the lowest paid employee gets. They did let that go when they um, became owned by a larger entity. Wow. But um, they've done a lot of interesting things. They were, I, I believe they may have been the first company to get B Corp certification, and now they're – parent company, which is the giant consumer packaged goods company, Unilever, yeah. um, is going for B Corp certification. That will be a game changer. When I love that. When something the size you know, of I... a Unilever or a Walmart starts to move radically toward a better world, other people follow. Well, how, you know, we gave kudos, you gave kudos to Walmart in the book about bringing the truckloads of food and, and clothing after Katrina. Mm -hmm. And yet they continue to pay out the lowest to their employees. They don't like to hire yeah, full time. I, I will not personally shop at Walmart because I have a <laughs> lot of issues with their labor policies. Yes. I have a lot of issues with their store siting policies. I have a lot of issues with a lot of things they do. Right. But one area where I have no issue is that they have used their might to uh -huh. green the entire supply chain for products in all sorts of categories. Um, it was, I guess, about 10 years ago that Lee Scott, who was the CEO at the time, got religion because one of his employees showed him that there was money to be made in it. And uh, interestingly enough, Walmart actually sells more organic food than Whole Foods. Right. And they sell it to people who largely don't go to Whole Foods. People who, mm -hmm. in many cases, have never been inside a Whole Foods. Yeah, and they've a made a $15 <laughs> billion dollar market in selling organic products to these people. Plus, they've greened their own operations in a thousand different ways because they understand they are the most bottom line driven company out there. They understand that they can make money and save money and thus right. lose their profits. So they still don't get me to shop there. 
But I I will use them as a model for how a company that is driven by the bottom line can become a socially responsible citizen. Excellent. Now, if we can only get them to change their labor policies. (laughs) Yeah, if they would only do that. Yeah, uh, that would be great. That's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. And um, you were talking about, and and I can't, sorry, I can't remember what it was, but I was, I loved it. It was about a a car. There was a car and not the Tesla car, but another car that somebody was developing. Kangaroo maybe? The one for people in wheelchairs? No, it, um, but it was going to get like fantastic. Like you could, I think that you could plug it in and it could be a source of energy for other things. Oh, this might've been the hypercar. This is another. The hypercar. Yeah. Now I remember being like, I'm a year I'm a year younger than you. So I remember 1973ish thinking, man, why don't they just you know, make a hydrogen car? Like why we have water, you know, molecules like we could why can't we just do that and get rid of all this, you know, these fumes and get rid of all this stuff and and here it is. Is it so based funny, on hydrogen? Because I was about the same age when I was doodling water powered cars. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it makes so much sense. It does, and I think we will see those. Uh, I'm not an engineer, and I don't really know what the problems are with that, but I do know that there are people working on it and that the hypercar project of Lovins is, in fact, hydrogen-powered. And um, he went, said in a speech that I uh, attended, he said that the energy to propel this huge SUV that can hold, like, a couple of kayaks and whatnot was about the same as what a Lexus SUV uses for air conditioning. Well, let me ask you this because I did I did talk to some people about you know the switchover let's say, and there's you know there's rumors of people um, getting you know hit taken out whatever language you want to use killed murdered um, because of their influence on the industry to get rid of um, you know gas cars. And I'm just wondering if you've heard of, you know, these are the, is, is it true? Is there really this conspiracy to, you know, not allow us to move in that direction because there's so much greed? Uh, we're going to go to a break in, in just a little under a minute. Here. I can't so, speak oh, to that seconds. really, but I can say that no idea can ever be truly suppressed. You can kill the messenger, but you can't kill the message. Right. And we see this certainly in the, in the political world of the incredible a flowering that has happened, for example, in South Africa. There was a lot of repression. A lot of people died there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I am not going into whether there are conspiracy theories in the auto, uh, auto industry. Auto that's industry, you're not? Okay, that's okay, because we're going to break. <laughs> <laughs> Stick around. We'll be right back. Don't stop. That's right. Don't stop listening. Mission Unstoppable with Coach Frankie Picasso will continue right after these messages. Stop. It's words you never heard. Got a lead foot? According to state troopers, here's what not to do when you get pulled over. Don't be a lachrymis and start crying right away. It doesn't help. But if you're under 20, crying won't be held against you. Don't ask for a break, and don't yell or start any argy-bargy. And one trooper said, if they're going to flirt with me to get out of a ticket, it would probably insult my intelligence. But unfortunately, I don't get hit on all that often. So flirting or being a gill flirt won't work. Did you know that 15% of all drivers get 76% of all traffic tickets? And the odds of winning if you challenge a traffic ticket in court are 1 in 3. So what should you do when you get pulled over for speeding? Be courteous to the officer and most of all, be honest. It's words you never heard. I'm Carolyn Davidson and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Words. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert, Annette Hammond. Ignoring joint pain will not make it go away, nor will avoid emotions that are uncomfortable and spark discomfort. Harvard Medical School states that the secret to joint pain relief is exercise. Doing the right exercises on a continuous basis can relieve pain and might even permit you to postpone or avoid surgery on a problem joint. But the benefits don't stop there. Being active sharpens your mind and benefits your heart. Harvard says that it nudges your blood pressure down and your morale up, eases stress, and shaves off unwanted pounds. But most importantly, it lessens your risk of dying prematurely. So what are you waiting for? Exercise helps relieve joint pain and so much more. Pain-free movement and a fabulous quality of life await you. 
for the Fitness Minute. I'm Annette Hammond. Okay, well, we are talking to the guerrilla marketer to heal the world, Mr. Shell Horowitz. And Shell um, can be found at his website, uh, www.transformpreneur.com, and that's T-R-A-N-S-F-O-R-M-P-R-E-N-E-U-R.com. And shall I give out your email? Sure. Shell, S-H-E-L, at greenandprofitable.com. So you can reach him at either of those two places. <laughs> and what will we find on your website, Shell? Well, you'll find those two assessments I talked about before. You'll find how to get uh, your very own copy of Guerrilla Marketing to Heal the World from your favorite bookseller or, if you'd like it autographed, from me directly. And the, the official publication date is April 19th, so Great. it's uh, upon us. Um, you'll find some cool resources <clears throat> Excuse me. About creating this type of business that, that we've been talking about, about a business that has something besides bottom line as its motivation, and I think you will find over the next few decades that this will become not just a competitive advantage, but a competitive necessity. That businesses that are only about the single bottom line will find that single bottom line withering. Where mm-hmm. businesses that are much more deeply looking at how do we solve a problem, how do we fill a need, those are the ones that are going to succeed. And just think about some of the amazing things that we've done in our lifetimes that used to be thought of as impossible. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I mean, wow, we carry the world's knowledge in our pockets. Who would know, talk? <laughs> it's like we're almost the same age. So I know that you watched the Jetsons. You had to. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I used to think, wow, how cool would it be to live in the world like the Jetsons? And so much of that stuff is, yeah, we are. We really are. The only thing we don't have is that little flying car around, and I, I'm waiting for that. <laughs> I can't wait to do that. Well, one. drone technology, we were close yeah. to it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, but think about when I, I live in a house that was built in 1743. When my house was built, humans did not envision humans going faster than a horse could pull them. Right. Okay. You're living in Massachusetts? Uh, Are you in Boston? Oh, no, you're outside I'm 100 Boston. miles west of Boston. I'm on the Connecticut River, uh, halfway oh. between Boston and Albany, halfway between Connecticut and Vermont. So Paul <laughs> right Revere came by your house. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that? I said Paul Revere came by your house. Uh, probably not. He was further <laughs> east. But, uh, uh, but, you know, my house was built the year that Thomas Jefferson was born. And right. at that time, nobody thought about people flying by overhead in the international space station at more than 17,000 miles an hour. Crazy. Um, you know, a, a lot of it is mindset. A lot of it is d- deciding that you could do something. Right. Uh, Henry Ford said, whether you think you can do a thing or whether you think you can't do a thing, you're right. Right. And uh, I'm going to read a little quote from Muhammad Ali that's in the book and that's also the basis oh, I love this. of the TED Talk. Yeah. Impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact. It's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration. It's a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. I use that quote as the basis for my TED Talk. I I, I just think it, it sums it up, that we really are shackled by our own perceptions of the barriers and not the actual barriers. I agree. You know, I talk about impossible a lot too in my book and, and I look at the, I am possible, mm-hmm. you know, I am possible, the impossible. And it's, it is, it's just an opinion. And, um, Edward de Bono, father of creativity. And I love this guy, you know, when he came out with the six hats, I don't know if you've ever played that game in corporate America, but the six hats, it makes you put on a different color hat around a table. And when you have a certain color hat, you have to play the role of that hat. And so, you know, when you're wearing the white hat, you have to give all of the reasons why it's going to work. And when you wear the black hat, all the reasons why it can't possibly work, but you're forced to go to that position and get creative. And I love that. And we can do that about any business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, he was a lateral thinking guy. Uh, 
Yeah. And, you know, I would encourage people, um, you know, if you're thinking about being an entrepreneur, you're thinking about having a business or you have a business and you want to, you know, reconfigure that business so that you can make an impact in the world, become a social enterprise, um, you know, gather around some people and sit in a room and brainstorm. Yeah, brainstorm. yeah. I, and I am very happy to be a resource for you. That'd be awesome. Do that. I, I can, you know, this is part of how I make my living is by consulting and, and training on this very thing. And it's very empowering when you see that actually you can make a difference. We are all taught that we can't make a difference, and mm-hmm. that is, frankly, a load of BS. We can make a difference. We have always made a difference. It is always individuals who will not take no for an answer. What is that, that old saying, saying um, uh, if you are telling somebody who, that something is impossible, please don't do that in a way that gets in the way of the person who's proving you wrong. Um, <laughs> <I like that. laughs> but, you know, think about, think, think about as dramatic a case as Nelson Mandela serving a life sentence in prison, emerging to become the president of a free and non-retributive South Africa. I know. Uh, think about Gandhi being thrown off a train actually in South Africa as a young man because he was the wrong color to sit in the car that he was in. And from that, coming back to lead a movement that defeated the largest and most powerful empire of its day. Now, again, these people didn't act by themselves. They gathered together with others. Right. Um, I, in my own life, I have an example. There was a, a local developer who wanted to put 40 McMansions up the side of our local mountain. And while all the experts were going, oh, this is terrible, nothing we can do, my wife and I organized a movement and we stopped the thing. And I thought it would take us five years. We did it in 13 months flat. I know. That's pretty phenomenal. I like that. I love that story. That's great. You know, I, I think that, that, you know, who was it um, that said, Something about, you know, a committed group of people can change the world. Was it Margaret? Uh, Margaret Mead? Mead. Something? Yeah. Margaret, never doubt that a committed group of people can change the go. world. The only thing that ever has, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's so true. It's so true. There, there's so many examples out in the world of, of people who are doing that. And, you know, big and small. And we think, you know, I had somebody on the show who um, they make underwear. They make underwear for women. And, and you know, the money goes um, because that's that's the one thing that is not donated, to, you know, to women in shelters who have run away from you know abusive re- re- uh, relations, and so of course you don't you don't donate underwear, but everybody needs it, mm-hmm. and so and so they encourage people to buy underwear so that they can give clean fresh underwear to you know the homeless or to different places, and you know just an idea like that, Lava May who who created, you know, took the buses that the city didn't want anymore and, and made wash stations for the homeless. And they pull up at a certain time every week or every day That's so cool. people can I get clean. That. It's so yeah, great. In the book, Guerrilla Marketing to Heal the World, I also have, a, uh, there's a guest essay by Onyx Silver, and he talks about 11 different models that businesses can be involved with, with charities in one way or another. And there's also dozens, if not hundreds of examples of businesses that are taking on these kinds of challenges and really reinventing a new way of doing business in our world. Right. And uh, the website, again, is transformpreneur.com, for the word transform, and then P-R-E-N-E-U-R. Um, and there's, all, again, a lot of resources up there. It's a pretty new website. I'm still developing it. But um, I, there's there a, are a lot of, there is a lot of stuff on, on, on this website, and it's pretty phenomenal. It, you know, there's so much information in the book there's so much information oh my gosh um so much information so many places in the book that you know people and and organizations that that you have looked at and and critic you know as a critic and and otherwise letting us know i mean you've done all the work for us all we have to do is go there and and read about these things go there and read it and then put it into practice and again i help the putting into practice part yeah one of the things i think that stops a lot of people from success is government you know the red tape of government and i was on a website talking about b corporations because i I love the idea of you know you can be certified um take the certification just like you can for quality but you don't have to actually become be certified so you know they're going oh it, it 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 just gets in the way and there's just too much work. And so we're not, you know, we don't want, we're not going to go there. And I thought, why wouldn't you go there? But, it becomes you know, a marketing advantage. And when you realize that, then you want to go there. 
Mm-hmm. I was the very first business to be certified at the gold level by Green America, and you better believe it. That that was some work, but you also better believe that I used that credential. Mm-hmm. I used the credential that I've been inducted into the National Environmental Hall of Fame. I I used the fact that people nice. like Jan Canfield of Chicken Soup and Seth Godin of Purple Cow have found my books worthy of endorsement. Uh, you take what you have and you make the most that you can with it. I think you know. I think that we have to mention Jay Levinson. My co-author, yes, the yeah, late Jay yeah. Levins, founder of the Guerrilla Marketing brand. Um, and, yeah, I, I did two books with him. I did Guerrilla Marketing Goes Green, which came out in 2010. And, you know, people ask me, why, why did you do this? Why did you partner with him when you had to do most of the work? Mm-hmm. And because I get to be part of the biggest marketing brand in history, mm-hmm. and he gets credibility in a whole new market, and there was no financial hit to me for doing this. I got the advance that I got that I had to divide by two and share with him was just about the same that I would have gotten as a one author book with that publisher for that particular space that I'm in. Uh, so it didn't actually cost me anything to do that. And for the rest of my life, nobody can ever take away that I'm a grill marketing author. I'm part of this incredibly strong brand. What, what did he mean? Really quickly, we've got two minutes left. What did he mean by guerrilla marketing for those people who don't know? Being quick and nimble, getting sometimes in and out even before the, the big dogs notice that there's a market there, mm-hmm. um, talking to people individually using creativity rather than money to penetrate a market, a lot of stuff like that. And uh, he, he, there are about 60 guerrilla marketing books out there. I'm particularly proud of, of course, Guerrilla Marketing Goes Green and the new and better Guerrilla Marketing to Heal the World. I think that's pretty phenomenal. I'm going to ask you a really quick question because it, 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 this is one that's been on my mind. We, we can eliminate war. You say that we can eliminate war, but we all know that war creates lots of money. So how are we going to take people out of the war business and help them make money by stopping war? Well, there's an awful lot of places we can redirect those funds. Uh, building infrastructure, that uh, converting our entire housing and, and office and manufacturing stock to renewable energy, enormous opportunities there. Um, fixing the, the problem of people not having a place to live, fixing the problem of people not having enough to eat. It, the list goes on and on and on. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. Thank you. You're listening to Shell Horowitz. Um, brilliant if they don't mind me saying so, author of of Guerrilla Marketing to Heal the World. And he, uh, I mean, he's given you some free gifts. He's given you a wonderful free gift to get his, you know, painless green book for free. He's given you the gift to contact him and he will help you. He will give you a bit of his time to help you, um, you know, finesse whatever idea that you have possibly or put it, turn it into an actual um, Yeah. Business. If people do one or both of those assessments at transformpreneur.com, then they can come to me and get 15 minutes to, to, to talk about what that process was like for them and where it could lead them. Well, thank you very, very much, Shaw. We've, you know, we've run out of time here, but I thank you again for being on Mission Unstoppable. You're definitely one of the unstoppable ones, so you're an unstoppable and a gorilla. Love it. All at the same time. <laughs> Take Thanks care, everybody. Thanks so much, Frank. <laughs> Bye now. Stories of people who, when the odds were against them, turned defeat into victory. You've been listening to Mission Unstoppable with Coach Frankie Picasso. See you next time, and always remember... Don't, 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 don't stop.